I have nothing, but I have everything. I've had the cover of Vogue, but no money to buy it. I strive for perfection, but prefer the beauty of imperfection. I'm at home in chaos. I'm not afraid of contradiction. They say I'm a rebel, but why would I adhere to someone else's vision when I've got my own? I will become Dr. Hogg on the 22nd of June from a contribution to fashion, yet I'm still not fully recognized by the British Fashion Council. When I grew up, we had no money, but my father enriched our lives with tales and inventions. There were few books in our house and no art, but the radio was on all day long, plays of mystery and suspense. My father made up stories. He inspired me to use every inch of my imagination. He presented me with a way to survive and flourish. For birthdays and Christmas, he'd reveal something he'd been making secretly for months in his garden shed, and he'd say, no one else has got one of these. He had the power to turn a doll's cradle made from old rubber tires and scavenged wood into treasure before my eyes. It's this sense of the gift that has driven me to give more than the obvious, to remove the barriers of the norm, and to break the rules that can stifle and restrict. It wasn't until after his death that I realized just what a gift he had given me. It was uh, 2012, and I was working in a collection, not at all knowing where it was going. I had no show and I had no title to pin my ideas to, just a feeling. I'd found a bundle of colorless sacking, but it had triggered off uh, these three-dimensional distorted shapes like exaggerated backs, and it started to formulate into big warrior helmets, and my great women warriors <laughs> would be wearing little more than brown, leather strapping. Then I got the call. <laughs> Would you like to show in Paris? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, this is the city of high class. This is Chanel and Dior territory. And here I am in the middle of a collection that is the total antithesis of high class fashion. But then it came to me, the title. I call my collection Notre Dame's. So now I had a direction, um, and then I realized where the shapes were coming from. Unknowingly, I was actually designing a hump. I was creating Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame. I could see the backdrop, a quick-fire collage of everything French, from Napoleon to Joan of Arc to Marie Antoinette. I'd open with the chime of the bells of Notre Dame, and the film clip of Quasimodo jumping onto it. My first outfit would be the hump and the rump, and she'd crawl on like the ugly, beautiful monster of the cathedral. So that was my Paris debut. And I dedicated it to my father, as he had died just a few months previously. I started to think, after the show, I started to think about the stories he would read to me every night when I was a young child before I went to sleep. There was one in particular that I really loved, but I couldn't remember what it was about, so I looked it up. Wikipedia, The Pilgrim's Progress, regarded as one of the most significant pieces of English religious literature. The first words my two-year-old ears would hear. <laughs> the protagonist came from a city called Destruction, and he was going on a journey with a hump of sin strapped to his back to gain spiritual enlightenment. Here was my Quasimodo. And my second outfit I had named Pilgrim, 
not at all knowing why, but it's there on the straps for placement. Pilgrim one, two, and three, like for the, the hips and the waist and the shoulders. And then I realized that previous collections had actually come from the same source, the Valley of the Shadow of Darkness, to Kingdom Come, and even in that one, I, had, I made a film for that, and the synopsis was a journey through bondage and restraint to enlightenment. My parents were spiritualists, but they never made any demands. My father had been planting roots of values since I was two years old. My father taught me to be unafraid to be different. He wrote to me in verse the whole of my life. I'm self-taught in fashion, so I work in a very unorthodox manner. With no finances, I have to work alone. And every season, after the show is finished, I go into my studio and I look around my room and I go, how am I going to make this 20 and 30 year old fabric work for me again without repetition? I allow my ideas to collide and take me somewhere I'd never dream of. It's when I'm at my highest that I feel that I'm witness to and actually not the creator of my work. It's when I'm not thinking that I feel I create my best work. I work insane hours, day and night, hardly seeing a soul. I'm at my most creative when I am in a recluse state. It's at best euphoric, but I always seem to be fighting. My collections have been warrior queen, goddess at war, galaxy warriors, war and peace. I made a collection in three weeks and called it Courage. This was a collection that I was never meant to be making. I'd been offered a show, this was 2014, I'd been offered a show, but I had to refuse because I was suffering from severe exhaustion, having worked the previous collection for three months solidly and solitary, having three hours sleep a night, so it was a forced absence. But three weeks before Fashion Week, I was contacted by Amnesty International. Would I give a nod to Pussy Riot in my collection because the Russian Olympic Games were running alongside Fashion Week? I couldn't believe it. I thought of all the times not to be showing. I admired Pussy Riot so much. And then I thought, I, st I started to see it. I admired them especially when they came out of jail, still resolute, still fighting, still determined, still courageous. And that's when I got it, the title of my collection. I could see it in my mind's eye, C-O-U, rage in italics. So now I had my title, <laughs> but I had no collection and I had no time, no models. But I was already visualizing the collection. I was visualizing it all in bright colors to represent gay culture, which is what they were fighting for. I never threw anything away, so I knew I had a big box of scraps, multicolor lycra that I could make 10 outfits from. I knew also that uh, <laughs> some things had never made it onto the catwalk, so I had at least 10 outfits from that or the model hadn't turned up, so I had another 10 outfits. I actually had a whole collection, so they weren't going to get just one balaclava as a gesture. They were going to get a whole collection dedicated to the cause. So I called up and I said, I know it's a bit late, but could I still show? And also, could I have the first day of Fashion Week because it falls on Valentine's Day and I wanted to use the amnesty slogan, love is a human right. I made banners for the collection. I made banners for the show. This collection is not for sale. Never in the history of fashion, I think, <laughs> as far as I know, Never in the history of fashion has anyone made a collection not to sell. But this is what I do season after season, as I have no infrastructure to make that selling collection, but I continue nonetheless. I just can't stop. When I returned to fashion in 2009, I had nothing 
but the belief that I had a collection in me. I worked solidly each week hoping that someone would give me a show, but as the weeks passed, I was thinking my grand idea of a show was really diminishing, but I knew loads of people who had clubs, so I thought something's going to happen. Something will turn up. Two weeks before Fashion Week, I got a call. Total stranger. Um, we love your work, and we hear you've got a collection. Would you like to show at the Science Museum? <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> so once again, I had the two weeks to work like crazy, finish it off, and then same old story, the night before the show, all through the night, five o'clock in the morning came and I thought, where's my finale outfit? <laughs> and then I realized I hadn't actually made it. It was still in my imagination. Uh, a month before, I had made all these shell-like buds from fine mesh and silk ribbons to adorn it, but I hadn't actually <laughs> made the garment. So I put everything aside. I grabbed a roll of fine mesh, chopped it freehand, made a basic shape, stitched it quickly, stuck it in the box with the buds and the ribbons, and uh, as many needles as I could find. Got to the show, and we got to the venue 20 minutes before the show was about to start, and uh, I grabbed two, actually I grabbed loads of uh, student dresses and asked them to just thread and keep threading needles, whilst my model stood naked with the sea through shell of the garment on her as I designed it and created it around her. She moved slowly as I worked and then at the last minute when she had to get onto that catwalk, she moved away and I could see that the, the needles were still hanging there and my first thought was scissors and then I thought, no, I saw the, the, the needles glint and shimmer and glisten in the light and I just thought, wow. This is the best part of the garment. It's like, it's like a frayed hem when I've not had time to finish it. And then I, and I think, well, that's what's given it life, so I'll fray even more. I often don't finish things <laughs> in time. Um, and I, but I've worked so hard and long on them that I just cannot show them. This is one example. It was so heavy. I'd made the top part and the bottom part. It had taken almost three weeks to make. There was no way that wasn't going on the catwalk. But the night before, I couldn't get it into the machine. I'd tacked the top and the bottom together. But trying to get the, the weight of it, my machine's side, the weight of it, it was impossible. So I just grabbed a piece of paper, wrote a note, and pinned it to it. Collection under construction. <laughs> After every show, I'm so broken that I feel I cannot go through this again. But I've started designing the next one. My fingers were bleeding from the intense hand sewing and, and studying of the last collection, but I just can't stop. I haven't got a name for the collection yet because I don't plan anything. I leave things to chance like the beautiful dangling needles swaying in the light as she gracefully walked onto the catwalk, belying the chaos behind. <laughs> and the presence of my father, even now, as in Glasgow, this very week, it was his funeral exactly five years ago. It's through disarray, disruption, and disorder that my work finds life, and from there, my voice. Thank you. <laughs>